Welcome to The National. We are following breaking news tonight. The Russian president says a military operation is now underway in eastern Ukraine. Ukraine's foreign minister calls it a full-scale invasion and says the time for the world to act is now. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has condemned what he calls an egregious attack. Our reporters in Ukraine, in Russia, and in Washington are ready with the latest in this fast-moving story. It is, of course, in Ukraine, where we will start. Margaret Evans in Kiev, standing by the capital. Margaret, what's the latest? Well, Andrew, uh, the sun is just coming up here. We have heard within the last hour um, the sounds of an explosion. It could have been anti-aircraft fire. We're not sure. Um, uh, earlier, we were hearing reports of the sound of explosions around the airport outside Kiev. Um, some contradictory reports coming out. The mayor uh, of Kiev saying that, that what people were hearing was anti-aircraft fire. Um, we are hearing from Russia, from the other side of the border, that they are targeting command structures uh, across Ukraine, but they are not targeting city cities. The Ukrainian foreign minister, uh, Dmitry Kuleba, has contradicted that, saying that Ukrainian cities are coming under attack. We're hearing reports that troops are landing in the port city of Odessa. We're hearing that things are bad in Kharkiv, which is a, a city, uh, mainly Russian language, uh, native Russian-speaking city close to the border with Russia in the north and the east. Here in the capital, people have been leaving. We've been seeing people coming down the street with their suitcases, but we've also seen people who look like they're going to work. Um, we're hearing that there are long lineups at the gas stations around the city, so potentially people are thinking of leaving. I would say that psychologically here, many people would have thought that this day wouldn't come if there was actually an attack coming on the capital, on the Ukrainian capital. And again, we can't confirm that that's really what's happening yet. Um, but I think most people would, would tell you that they didn't or couldn't imagine and still wouldn't imagine that Russia would want to attempt to occupy Ukraine. Certainly they would believe that uh, Vlad Vladimir Putin is interested in potentially regime change here. And some people thought that he would attempt to do that by squeezing this country rather than launching a full scale military operation, because we've seen a lot of hybrid warfare. Um, we've seen yesterday there were just, you know, in the hours leading up to to the explosions and the, the, the news that it, the invasion had begun. We heard about more uh, cyber attacks here with a number of Ukrainian government ministry sites going down. That's been happening in the days leading up to that. And of course, the economy here has been suffering. You've seen some businesses leaving the country. You've seen um, even before today's operation, you saw some major airlines starting to cancel their flights to Ukraine and a destabilization in terms of psychological warfare, people really not knowing what to do to expect, whether there was an invasion, whether there wasn't, and it was starting to really fray on people's nerves. So it's still very, very early days, early hours here. We're waiting to see what developments come. And of course, we're watching social media to see what people are saying uh, in other parts of the country as well. Right. Psychologically, it must be unnerving, if not debilitating. But to your point, with so many conflicting reports and so many early reports coming out from all directions, important to take things one step at a time. Margaret Evans reporting from Kiev tonight. Thank you so much for that. Now, we've got Briar Stewart on the line as well. Uh, this coming from Rostov on Don in Russia. Briar, you're near the Ukrainian border, near that operation that Vladimir Putin says is underway. Can you tell us what you're hearing? Well, what the Russian Defense Ministry has said is that they're taking uh, targeted strikes against Ukrainian military installations. Uh, but of course, as you heard Margaret say there, there's conflicting information about, um, you know, the, the, what, what is being hit and whether or not cities are under attack. Uh, as far as the picture here, we know that the airspace has been closed not only um, over Ukraine, but over the, the bordering region as well. So where I am in rostov on Don, it's also been closed a uh, uh, little further to the west uh, in Sochi. And so you have um, a rapidly developing situation. And this really all started after President Vladimir Putin 
had a speech that was aired on Russian television uh, early this morning. And it was a speech, I should mention, that wasn't live. And Russian media is actually reporting that it was recorded three days ago on February 21st. And in that recording that, that was aired, it is essentially a declaration of war. He talked about how Russia could not live with the threat of Ukraine and that Ukraine had to be demilitarized. He then went on to talk about how if there was any kind of interference from the West, anything at all, uh, Russia would hit back and that he hopes the West hears that warning because plans were already uh, in the works. So it was a, a very, um, you know, chilling message really to hear. And then after that, that's when we started getting all of these reports of explosions in so many different cities across Ukraine. I should mention that, you know, as we've been here in this area talking to people, even people who've been living in communities where they've seen the backdrop of tanks and heavy artillery uh, for weeks, who, who have seen kind of the military built up around them, there was really a sense of disbelief among a lot of Russians that we spoke to that there would be some kind of full-scale attack. Um, this is an area where they, they know about the, the war going on in Donetsk and Luhansk, and they've there was a lot of support, I would say, for, for Russia uh, recognizing those areas because you have uh, areas where they are already controlled by separatists, they're aligned with Russia, over 700,000 people in those regions have Russian passports. So there was a lot of support for that. But speaking to Russians about kind of a, a larger attack on Ukraine, most people just did not believe something like that would happen. I mean, even people that we were speaking to yesterday and the day before, they just didn't think that Russia would take uh, actions against so many Ukrainian uh, cities and, and military infrastructure. So it'll be very interesting to see just how the, the public responds to that, because as we know in Russia, there's been such a, a repressive system and a, and a crackdown that you don't see the kind of large-scale protests here that you would elsewhere. Right, and of course, we will wait to see to what extent this invasion will progress, how protracted a campaign it might be uh, if it continues beyond the next, uh, next few minutes, few hours, few days. We don't know. Briar Stewart, reporting from Rostov-on-Don in Russia. Thank you. Let's go to Susan Ormiston in Washington. Uh, Susan, what are the international moves that we're seeing tonight? President Biden has been speaking to Ukrainian President Zelensky tonight from the White House where he is monitoring the crisis. Earlier, Biden released a statement where he said the prayers of the entire world are with the people of Ukraine as they suffer an unprovoked and unjustified attack by Russian military forces. President Putin has chosen a premeditated war that will bring a catastrophic loss of life and human suffering. And Russia alone is responsible for the death and destruction the attack will bring. The U.S. and its allies and partners will respond in a united and decisive way, he said. The world will hold Russia accountable. Now, President Putin made a chilling warning that you heard about that any foreign attempt to interfere with Russia's actions will be met with, quote, consequences they've never seen. And he said that just as an emergency Security Council meeting got underway tonight, the Secretary General said this was the saddest moment in his tenure and he demanded Putin pull back. President Putin, stop your troops from attacking the Ukraine. Give peace a chance. Too many people have already died. And there were some very heated moments tonight at the U.N. with the ambassador of Ukraine telling the Russian envoy there is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell. The Russian envoy was trying to tell the council that this isn't a war. It's a special military operation. But Ukraine's interior minister, of course, has confirmed that what we've been hearing, missile attacks in Kiev, blasts in Kharkiv, shelling in Mariupol, perhaps an amphibious landing at Odessa. What we don't know tonight still is how wide is this attack and how far Russia will push into Ukraine. Earlier today, we heard widespread condemnation of Russia's actions at the UN, including from Canada's Representative Bob Ray. Russia and its acolytes can spin and can contort all they want. But the violations of international law are theirs. The loss of life, the wounding, the pain, the suffering are all their responsibilities. 
Now, tonight we are hearing from Ukrainian's foreign minister, Kaleba. He's saying on Twitter that world, the world must impose devastating sanctions. And we may hear more about that tomorrow as the G7 meeting gets underway virtually. Stronger sanctions, part of that discussion. The White House indicated this week it had a second tranche available. And Biden tonight said he will impose further conse consequences. But so far, it is appears that President Putin doesn't care. Ukraine is shutting down its airspace, its civilian aircraft. Civilian aircraft is diverting around Ukraine. Overnight markets are falling. The price of oil rising above $100 U.S. for the first time since 2014. And that was the last time Russia moved into Ukraine in Crimea. Andrew. Susan Ormiston, lost to track on the international front. Thank you so much. Okay, now let's bring in Murray Brewster in Ottawa because, Murray, can you tell us first what we're hearing from the Canadian government on this? Well, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has issued a statement this evening and he is calling the actions in Ukraine by Russia an egregious attack. And the statement goes on to say that Russia's actions will be met with severe consequences. Tomorrow morning, I will be meeting with G7 partners and we will continue working closely and quickly with NATO and our allies to collectively respond to these reckless and dangerous acts. A couple things that we can pull out of the statement here uh, tonight, Andrew. Uh, the first thing is that Canada will be imposing further sanctions against Russia. There were sanctions that were introduced on top of sanctions that were already there. Um, when uh, President Putin uh, declared uh, the, the independent republics uh, of uh, eastern Ukraine and that they had Russia's support. So uh, we can expect to see more sanctions. Canada does have a lot of room to, uh, to uh, issue sanctions against Russia because it was 2019 the last time that Canada sanctioned Russia over uh, any uh, matters uh, that related to uh, events in Ukraine. But the other thing we can pull out of the Prime Minister's statement tonight is that uh, there's going to be more consultation with NATO allies. As part of Canada's sanctions announcement the other day, Canada uh, announced that it was going to be sending more troops to Eastern Europe to bolster the Canadian contingent that was in Latvia as part of NATO's Operation Reassurance. That those reassurance measures are for Eastern European NATO allies who are unnerved by what uh, is taking place uh, in Ukraine. And uh, we can probably expect to see more uh, support for NATO from Canada over the next few days. Right. So, so that's the view from Canada. But Murray, uh, t talk to me about the operation in Ukraine that is unfolding right now, because you've been speaking with military experts. What should we be reading into the moves that we've seen so far from Russia? Well, it is a fast-moving situation, Andrew. Now, we are getting uh, significantly reports of landings in Odessa, which is in the south of Ukraine. Uh, there have been reports of uh, missile attacks on command and control centers, uh, primarily uh, around, the, uh, around the airport, the international airport in Kyiv. Uh, there have been reports of explosions in Kirkov. Uh, close to the Russian border. President Putin basically said that this is going to be a military operation in the Donbass region in the eastern part of Ukraine. So we have forces that are co apparently coming in from the south in Odessa. There appears to be uh, uh, more shelling and a major military operation underway in the east. And potentially there could be one in the north. So that gets uh, Ukraine and uh, the, the capital of Kyiv in, almost caught in a pincer. And uh, we don't know the extent of the operations right now, but a lot of the military experts that I've been speaking to over the last several weeks have said that even with 190,000 troops, which is approximately what uh, Western intelligence has suggested Russia has, Russia still doesn't have enough forces to be able to take, and most importantly, hold the entire country of Ukraine, because Ukraine is a vast country. So um, there's going to be um, an attempt by the Russian military, at least according to a number of experts, to perhaps go around the major cities and uh, to, to cut them off and to isolate them uh, over the next few days. Those are some of the things that we could potentially be seeing, in addition to a very sustained air campaign of missiles and perhaps bombs. 
a broad array of possibilities in the coming hours and days. Murray Brewster, thank you so much for that. You're welcome. So as we continue to watch this breaking news unfold in Kiev in Ukraine right now, we're still waiting for many details. There's a lot that we don't know about the Russian incursion that they announced just hours ago. Uh, we don't know the scale of the, the strategic in, intent, what Russian President Vladimir Putin hopes to achieve with this military operation. We don't know the extent of, of casualties or if even there are any at this stage of the game. We also don't know anything about specific targets, just that there have been sporadic, sometimes conflicting reports of explosions around Kyiv, around the airport, also around particularly the eastern part of the country, also in Kharkiv to the northeast. If I could, I'd like to take a moment here just to link up with Viktor Semenov, who's been kind enough to make some time to join us. Because, Viktor, you're joining us from Mariupol in, in Ukraine. Yes. Can, can you start just by explaining, I mean, were you awake at the time? Because this happened early in the morning when Russia announced its invasion and that it would be moving forward. Tell me what happened from your point of view, what your reaction was. I was surprised uh, the, the, the reaction, and I was awakened in uh, an hour ago, not when the invasion begin, began. And uh, uh, if if I would say was I surprised, uh, was was, a, was anyone surprised in Ukraine? I would say no, because uh, we defend ourselves for eight years. It's it wars has never ended for the eight years uh, from the beginning, and we are just awaited all the time that Russia will do an invasion. But anyway, <laughs> it's a war in Europe. They are, they are doing a missiles attacks to our capital, to the cities nearest, to my city. Uh, here was an, uh, an, an artillery bombing uh, uh, this night in our city. A lot of people was uh, saying uh, it was loud explosions and now now you have to understand it's a morning it's an early morning in ukraine so a lot of people uh most of people uh, don't know yet about the uh, invasion if they are not in the cities that were attacked and and the situation do, do you have any sense at this point in in how much danger you or your family or your neighbors may be in at this point in the sense of how far away you may be from the conflict from any fighting that may be happening right now <sighs> We are, we are personally. I uh, in this Mariupol. We are in ten kilometers from uh, from the line. Uh, I do not know anything about how unsafe I am or how not. But I see now chats of my friends. They are telling in Telegram. They are telling like we are running away from the city. No one knows nothing. Uh, we are we are believe that uh, our army can stand for Ukraine and the sp and they, all the world uh, will support Ukraine. For now, we know nothing. There are explosions, there are artillery, there are a lot of messages about the troops of Russians that are invading near Kharkiv. They're uh, striking Kyiv, they're striking the bases in Dnipro. There's uh, an information about troops near Mariupol from the sea. But we don't know actually a lot. We know that invasion was started and that Putin uh, is invading Ukraine. It's the only things we know. For now, in city center, it's safe. But uh, who knows? It's 10 kilometers to front line. Right. And, and so, Victor, how prepared are you right now if the situation changes? Because we know things are very fluid right now. And you mentioned how where you are right now is safe. You believe it to be safe, but that could change very quickly. What are you going to do from this point on? How prepared are you? Uh, you have to know one thing. A lot of people are very angry. We have not fear. All the fear left in uh, eight years before. A lot of pe people now, uh, some, some will run away from city, some will stay. Personally, I and my girlfriend, we plan to collect our items to backpacks and go in two hours to the when, when the city awake. We are going to the center where all the volunteers, the active part of Mariupol, uh, meet each other and we will uh, discuss the situation and choose how to protect our land uh, against the invasion. Uh, personally, I don't want to run from the city, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I know nothing about the situation. If I'm still uh, in the city center and uh, if front line is 10 kilometers away, then I have. I believe that Russian was stopped for some time uh, outside the city. You know, I, I'm struck by how composed you are in this moment. And, and you know, I, I, I take your point that, and I've heard from a number of Ukrainians that they've been in this sort of a situation, not just for the last few weeks or the last few months, but for, for years. Can I ask you 
just on a human level, how are you feeling? How are you doing right now? I'm full of fear, of course. Um, it's 10 minutes ago, my voice was trembling and uh, it's war. I don't know. I have never been uh, living in the time of uh, war in the I was read the books about World War II, World War One, and other conflicts, and uh, I didn't I didn't uh, expect to uh, so see war in my own eyes in center of Europe. Of course, it's I'm fear, yeah. But uh, when you have a plan, the fear uh, back, uh, c comes back or not? Uh, it retreats from you. So I plan to discuss it with my friends, with the people in Mariupol and do my plan and not to worry a lot because we have never no no place to run we have to stand for our place our country and uh, to rely on our allies uh, from all the world it helps a lot and I believe and thank you for the help in Ukraine Victor Semenov uh, we wish you all the best I hope you are able to stay safe I hope you're able to get all the information that you need to make sure that you stay safe and I hope you're able to get in contact with all of your friends and family to make sure they're okay as well. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you in advance. Thank you. Bye-bye. We have more breaking news coverage coming your way over the course of the program as Russia commences its military operation into the eastern part of Ukraine. Lots more still to come on this story as it develops. We'll be back. Welcome back. We are following breaking news tonight in Ukraine. That country's foreign minister says Russia has launched a full-scale invasion of the country and says the world can and must act now. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has released a statement condemning what he calls Russia's egregious attack. We do have reporters standing by in Kiev, in Russia, near the border, and in Washington, D.C., we're going to bring you more on all of that in just a few minutes. But first, we are going to turn to a major development today here at home. Ten days after the federal government made history invoking the Emergencies Act for the very first time, the prime minister says the emergency is over and use of the act revoked. It was brought in to, of course, end border blockades and the protest occupation near Parliament Hill. But it stirred its own controversy from day one. Some agreed it was necessary. Some called it an overreach. Now, though... It's gone as quickly as it arrived. David Cochran explains why the prime minister says today was the day to end it. The streets of Ottawa have been mostly clear and quiet since Sunday. So with crews cleaning up and fences coming down, the prime minister says the time for emergency powers is over. We are confident that existing laws and bylaws are now sufficient to keep people safe. A surprise announcement coming while the Senate was still debating whether to approve the use of the Emergencies Act in the first place. The Trudeau government failed to make its case. Ms. Blaney. Ms. Blaney. Mr. Bouleris. And less than 48 hours after New Democrats voted with the Liberals to endorse it. I declare the motion carried. As I said, this was always proportional and time limited and now gone entirely. Since the police moved in, the gravitational forces that fueled this occupation are largely gone. The crowds dispersed, the money cut off. Key convoy leaders in jail or out on bail, but ordered to leave Ontario and have no contact with the convoy. We've been calling all along for the moment that the, the, those provisions are no longer necessary to revoke it. And we're satisfied that today, uh, the provisions of the Emergency Act were revoked. The NDP says the threshold has been met to revoke the order. The Conservatives say Trudeau is backing away from a power grab. Nothing has changed in the past 48 hours except the Prime Minister, we believe, recognized how wrong he was to invoke it in the first place. The emergency phase is over. Now the accountability phase begins. A special parliamentary committee will study the government's use of these powers, while a mandatory public inquiry will investigate the circumstances that led to these emergency measures in the first place. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, the protesters may have left Ottawa, but not all of them have gone home. As Ashley Burke shows us, some are still gathered just outside the city, deciding their next move. A vestige of a movement that took over downtown Ottawa 
for 23 days. A shrinking camp on private property not far outside the city. 60 vehicles seen here Monday, now roughly 20 and only a few large trucks. Protesters wouldn't let media inside the camp, but sent out a trucker to help us when CBC's van got stuck. You guys are going to believe this story. Wearing a defund the CBC hat, trucker Tyson Garo towed us out of the snow and live streamed it all. We don't leave Canadian stuck no matter who. That's what I said. That's where I've been sleeping. Garo said he lost his job in road maintenance because he's been in Ottawa demonstrating all month for his grandchildren's freedom. Now he isn't sure what comes next. The plans we were really unaware of right now, a lot is lying in the... We're, I mean, we're not looking to cause trouble. Paper towels, napkins. One protester bags, live streaming socks. from inside the camp committed to continuing to push back against COVID restrictions, but in a lawful way. We're not going to convoy, but we are going to do a march. This is just one of three camps that are set up within roughly an hour's drive of Parliament Hill. One is to the west in Armprior, another to the south in Greeley, and the third to the east in Van Cleek Hill. These police officers are visiting the sites to tell protesters what they can and cannot do. I'm sure the message is quite clear with these individuals that uh, they will not be allowed back to the, the uh, downtown area for obvious reasons. This may be just simply sites where people can uh, simply drink, dance, have fun after a, a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, they may be plotting their next steps. The Prime Minister said today that he still sees these camps as a threat, but that he's been assured by police they can handle it without use of the Emergencies Act, and that authorities are in a much stronger position to keep blockades and occupations from coming back to streets like this in front of Parliament Hill. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Now let's bring Chief Political Correspondent Rosemary Barton in on this. So Rosie, there are a few questions after today, one being, why now? Yeah, Andrew, the government obviously was very aware for the potential for further political backlash here, but also the possibility of losing public support for this. There's no longer any one event or demonstration or protest that police presumably could not handle to point to as evidence that this was needed or still needed. So the criticism from all corners, even those who supported the use of the act in the short term, was that it either was overreach or it was going to become government overreach. And the last thing the prime minister wanted here was to be perceived as abusing his powers, as he said himself. Himself today, the emergency is over, and so is the act. Okay, so was it a success? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the question that we, we need to answer. It was, certainly will be answered in part uh, during this inquiry and the review of the act that's built into the legislation. There are a series of court challenges that will test it. Whether it was a success, I would say, depends on where you're sitting. Ottawa residents would probably say for sure. Conservatives would say it was used because there was a failure to act before. Police would say they needed it in order to get the blockade ended. So the success question, I think, has yet to be answered. But 10 days after invoking the act, the blockade is over, and the federal government can can at least certainly claim responsibility for helping to do that. Okay, Rosie, thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. And up next, we return to our top story. Russia launching a military operation inside Ukraine. Coming up, we've reached a resident in the capital, Kiev. More breaking news coverage right after the break. Welcome back to our breaking news coverage of events that are unfolding right now as we speak. Uh, an attack that the Ukrainian foreign ministry has characterized as a full-scale invasion. Russia certainly hours ago did announce that it was going to commence a military operation, a special military operation in the eastern part of the country. We have been hearing conflicting reports about potential targets and what is actually happening on the ground, but there have been sporadic reports of people hearing explosions and the like. Now, earlier, I was joined by Irvin Student, who is the editor-in-chief of Global Brief magazine, and I asked him, amid reports that people in Kiev were just going about their normal mornings, despite this military operation happening, what he thought was going on. Ukraine is a huge country. It's the biggest country in Europe after Russia, territorially. Very big population as well, 40, 45 million, somewhere in between there. So we're in the fog of war. Uh, the Ukrainians, like the Russians, have been a lot through their history. So there's a certain sang froid. Uh, they're not deeply panicked. They're properly worried because they would know 
more than we would in the West through personal networks and information, what's coming roughly. Uh, the other thing that is underappreciated is, is that the Ukrainians have a very rich sense of humor. And even through the war, I think that will keep them going. They, they, they know how to laugh. So that's how you square the two. But let us not underestimate the penchant, the penchant of both sides for war. They're both uh, warrior nations, and this can get very ugly very fast on right. both sides. Be because at this point, you know, of course, we have to acknowledge that anytime we talk about an incursion or an invasion, there's a pretty broad spectrum of violence that we could potentially see uh, from very little to, to quite a bit. But to try to figure out how much violence we might see, I guess we have to get at the intent. So what is Vladimir Putin, in your mind, trying to achieve at this point in time? I think he has two audiences. His primary audience is domestic. And as I mentioned on, on The National last night with, with Janice, the, uh, he's in, at the end of his règne, his fin de règne, as we say in French. So he's consolidating the fort for his successor. Big historical moves, the biggest country on earth. It's a very young country. It's in a rut. It's in a rut psychologically, spiritually, economically, administratively. And he's trying to reconsolidate the center in order to ensure that Russia doesn't crumble after he leaves, which is a real uh, issue. And the second audience, less important, is us in the West and Ukraine in particular. Unfinished business, not so much after the Cold War, but really the general architecture of Russia as he again leaves office. The 2000, the 2014 revolution, Ukraine, the Crimean annexation, as I mentioned, radicalized three houses, and it must be understood thus. It radicalized Ukraine. It radicalized Russia against Ukraine and the West, and radicalized us in the West against Russia. All of these parties remain radicalized, Russia and Ukraine especially. So it's in that context of radicalization that he's making some moves uh, towards there, which, by the way, will further radicalize at least those two houses, Ukraine and Russia. Can I, can I ask you what you think the range of international response might be at this point in time? You know, our understanding right now is that the U.S. president... Joe Biden is speaking with Ukrainian President Zelensky, uh, you know, as we speak. What would you expect to see on the international stage? I don't think that conversation is going to yield anything. Uh, I think the West, we in the West have played most of our cards, and the economic cards obviously don't impress because the Russians, like chess players, would have already discounted those costs into their behavior and considered them acceptable given their larger goals at this point. The big cards are to be played, as I mentioned last time, by Asian countries. That is my hope, that is my uh, proposal for anyone uh, listening. I'm, con I'm thinking of countries like Israel, which has huge networks in both Russia and Ukraine, one-sixth of the population ru Russian-speaking, and their analytics are superior. I'm thinking about China, India, South and North Korea, and Japan, maybe even Singapore to a lower, to a lesser extent. These are countries that are respected within both Kiev and Moscow, that have uh, relative neutrality. That is, they're neither NATO nor are they CSTO, uh, the Collective Security Treaty Organization post-Warsaw Pact. So it's got to be a neutral force, a neutral diplomatic effort. Uh, but the military game will have to play its, its, its its cards for a little while, its momentum, and then there'll be room for uh, diplomacy. And I suspect both the Ukrainian and the Russian sides, chess players, will allow for that. They'll continue to speak to one another. Well, we will see if, if the brinksmanship will come to an end soon or whether this will be more of a protracted campaign. Uh, Irvin Student, very good of you to join us, uh, as always. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate that. Thanks. And you are watching Breaking News coverage on The National. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our breaking news coverage here on The National of the situation unfolding right now as we speak in Ukraine. Russia's President Vladimir Putin announcing a special military operation getting underway in the eastern part of the country, the extent of which 
is unknown, difficult to discern at this point for, for reasons I'm sure you can understand. There have been many conflicting reports up until this point about targets, about what exactly is happening on the ground. There have been sporadic reports of explosions, people either seeing or hearing explosions. But what we do know is that international condemnation has been swift. The U.S. president, Canada's prime minister, responding, Justin Trudeau, saying that this attack was egregious and that there will be consequences. Now let's talk to someone who is very close to this developing story. Peter Zalmayev is in Kiev. He is the director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. First of all, uh, Peter, thank you for joining us. How are you? Thank you. Well, I was woken up about an hour ago with these loud explosions, you know, uh, the sirens going off. I'm smack in the center of the city. The, the explosions were kind of distant, these loud sonic booms, you know, um, about uh, a dozen of them. Uh, sirens are going off and uh, lots of sounds of traffic. Obviously, the civilians have started to flee. And right. So, so what is the protocol there? I mean, walk us through that. So when you hear explosions and the sonic booms and the sirens, what is it that you and the others uh, in your nearby vicinity began to do? Well, uh, folks obviously are reacting emotionally uh, to it. It's, 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 it's maybe part of a psychological operation that we warned uh, about all along. But the Ukrainian president spoke just uh, a, a moment ago and he said to, uh, for, for folks to, st to stay calm and to stay at home. Uh, this is probably the, not the time to flee uh, Kiev simply because it might be very difficult to do. Um, the hope is that, you know, there will be not, no strikes on civilian centers. Vladimir Putin, whom you cannot take at his word at all, but at least he said that he's not doing so. So far, the indications are that he's going after military infrastructure, um, uh, infrastructure and other uh, uh, installations throughout the country. There may be a, 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 an, an invasion on overland uh, in the area of Odessa and Kherson and even Kharkiv. So far, folks in Kiev are saying that the explosions are happening around the city. Maybe a military airport may have been hit. Uh, there are also there's a concern that when it comes to the, the, the center, there may be a hits on ministries, ministries of defense, ministries of eternal affairs, etc. Right, because on that point, what is the fear in your mind and on on your, your fellow Ukrainians' minds right now that there could be some kind of incursion, some kind of an attack on civilian areas where, where people live and work. Well, the, the, you have to read, you know, Vladimir Putin, you know, reading him between the lines, obviously, when he said that, you know, we're, at, we're, we're not going after civilians, we're trying, we're going to demilitarize and denazify de Ukraine. Uh, and he said that we will bring to justice all those who've been waging uh, kind of a genocide against people in East, in the Eastern Ukraine. So he's referring to the current government, maybe the previous government, uh, members of the of parliament. That that may mean that he is going to try to actually reach them, and the only way to reach them is by land. So that's 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 a concern. And finally, a very ominous note to all who might want to defend Ukraine: he's uh, appealing to the West to stand down. Uh, it, so it sounds to me like a hint at a nuclear uh, blackmail. He's hinted at nuclear blackmail in years past. He's uh, provided this uh, you know, image of a cornered rat likening himself essentially to a cornered rat. He says when the rat has been cornered, he, it will strike. And I think this is what we're hearing from him. You know, should you try to intervene, we're going to hit you with something you just you couldn't have imagined. You know, that's, right. I, I think this is nuclear blackmail be we're talking about. Because what, what is what would be your appeal at this point of time to the mm -hmm. international community, to anyone watching this situation unfold from the outside in? This is not the time to back down. You know, this is not the time to go all out with sanctions and hit them really, really hard. I think Johnson has already commented, uh, and it seems like the, uh, the Western leaders are trying to get their act together. It's just also, uh, uh, you know, and out, out, and what we're seeing is the results of this complacent policy towards Vladimir Putin. We saw this as, uh, first escalation, if you remember, in the spring, and there was no response to that. All along, there were these steps that the West could have and should have taken for each to address each Russian provocation. It hasn't been done, and now you were pay, paying a full price for that. And so what, just as we have about 30 seconds left, what is it that you are prepared or even able to do at this point? I mean, you've had the advice to, to, to stay at home, not to flee. What is going through your mind as you think about what your moves are over the next few hours and the well, next few days? 
Yes, well, I'm, obviously, uh, you cannot rule out this. This may be my last internet connection. The phones are also already working sporadically. So uh, just trying to stay in touch with friends, uh, you know, having their address, physical addresses, so you can actually coordinate your, you know, go to their places directly. Uh, but I'm staying right here. I'm staying right now uh, in, in Kiev, you know. There's, uh, there's no other way. There's no way to fly out anymore. So just, you know, hoping and praying and staying calm. That's the only way you can do it. Peter Zalmayev, you are remarkably calm in this moment. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us, and I hope you are able to stay safe. A reminder of the breaking news that we are following tonight. You are looking at Kiev right now. The atmosphere tense after Russia announced that a military incursion in Ukraine's east has begun. The airspace over the country closed with reports of explosions coming in. like in Kiev in the early morning hours. You can hear that sound of air raid sirens. There were explosions as well. Russia's attack on Ukraine underway. For now, though, we are going to turn back just for a moment to this country and to Nova Scotia's inquiry into one of Canada's worst ever mass shooting shootings. The events in and around port traumatized an entire community, including some firefighters caught in the middle who two years later say they still don't feel heard. Kayla Hounsell explains. On that terrible Sunday morning, the Onslow Belmont Fire Brigade had been turned into a comfort center. The gunman, Gabriel Wartman, was still on the loose when two RCMP officers mistakenly shot at the fire hall. They thought a municipal official in a safety vest was their suspect. I lost part of my life and fire hall was like a second home to me. Fire Chief Greg Muse and his deputy were inside when the shots rang out. We hid, you know, under tables, under chairs for an hour, uh, not knowing who fired upon us. They say the officers left without explanation. Nova Scotia's police watchdog cleared them of any criminal wrongdoing. The firefighters initially hoped the inquiry would provide some answers, but they say they lost hope when investigators didn't even reach out to them until their lawyers pushed them to this month. I've been disappointed all along and uh, in the, the way the commission has handled um, the proceedings so far. The inquiry's mandate is broad. Public hearings opened this week with commissioners explaining life in rural Nova Scotia and the structure of policing. They're warning the next session, starting next week, will be much different. I'm going to be real here. The information that we are going to start sharing on Monday is disturbing. It's awful. The firefighters say their story is largely forgotten when the bigger story is told. And I think that's just something important that people have to realize that, that it's, you know, there's an, pretty much an entire community that's been traumatized. When hearings resume on Monday, the Commission will begin laying out what it has learned about those two days in April 2020. That will include sharing transcripts and audio of 911 calls. The final report is expected in November. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. And we are going to take a short break, but we will be back right after this. Welcome back to our breaking news coverage of an unfolding attack on Ukrainian soil. Russia has been massing troops on its border with Ukraine for months. The threat of an invasion always looming. The international community roundly condemning the dangerous posturing. Opening dialogue with Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, to try to talk him back from the precipice. But whether through diplomacy, the threat of sanctions or otherwise, that route has fallen short. Russia announcing hours ago that it was to commence a special military operation in the country's east, openly declaring the intent to demilitarize Ukraine. And both before and after that statement, we have seen sporadic reports of explosions in Ukraine's capital and in other major cities, such as Kharkiv in the northeast. We do not know the full extent of the attack, the extent of any casualties, if any, or damage, or for how long Russia plans to continue its operation. 
The international community, however, has roundly condemned the attack and said that they will, they will, there will be rather additional sanctions to come. This is a very fluid story, but that's where we'll leave things tonight. Thank you so much for joining us here on The National for this February 23rd. We'll continue to follow these developments over the coming days. Good night.